Welcome to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. For each week, we speak with brands, icons, innovators, and trailblazers within the fly fishing industry, exploring both the successes and failures they've encountered along the way to become who they are today. But first, if you have not yet subscribed to the podcast or joined our email list, please do so by going to the Fly Fisher Insider Podcast.com, or you can also find us on Instagram at Fly Fisher Insider Podcast. Now let's begin. Today, our guest is Mariko Izumi. Mariko is the niece of Canadian fishing icon Bob Izumi. Mariko has a rich family history of being in the fishing business. She was also the host of WFN's Hooking Up with Mariko, a TV show lasting six seasons. Mariko is actively involved in the fly fishing film tour and is widely known for her consistent appearances in events, seminars, and sportsman's shows. Mariko also operates a blog on travel and other interesting outdoor events. Her company helps outdoor lifestyle brands establish growth and product awareness with her skill sets. When not working or traveling, Mariko can be found at home relaxing with her family. Mariko, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. And also, that intro was so good. I'm just thinking as you're reading that, that I need you to send that to me. It's a perfect summary of my life. Perfect. I love it. I'll make sure I do that. Well, you know what? We, we did our research and we wanted to make sure that you were uh, well presented here because your family is a fishing icon here in Canada, well respected. And I mean, globally as well, but particularly here in Canada, it's home. So with that said, Mariko, I want to jump right into it. Can you tell us a little about yourself? Like who is Mariko Izumi? Sure. So like you touched upon, I grew up in a fishing family in Ontario, Canada, about 45 minutes outside of Toronto. And if you really want to go back, my grandpa was the first person to start the first ever catch and release bass fishing tournament in Canada. And then obviously was heavy into fishing. And so my whole family always fished. And the year I was born was the year that my uncle and my dad decided to start their own fishing TV show. And that was the early 80s. So it's not like now where there's literally hundreds of shows, and podcasts, and YouTube shows about fishing. Back then, there was like maybe two or three in the US and zero in Canada. So I grew up with my uncle being the face and the fisherman of the show and my dad doing the business side of things. Uh, My family and I would just travel with them, go on those adventures and have a camera around and then go to trade shows. And through the years, Bob got really popular and he's kind of like the Wayne Gretzky of fishing for Canada, right? For at least for freshwater bass fishing, for sure. Absolutely. Yes. Um, so that formed my lifestyle, I would say, because I grew up having a varied schedule and also traveling a lot and also being somewhat in the public eye. So went off to university and all that sort of thing. Didn't really think I was going to actually, I didn't think it was going to shape my career, but it did turn out to shape my career because the year that I graduated from university, World Fishing Network, which is merged now, but 10 years ago, it was a big deal in Toronto. I started up, I started working with them. I wanted to go back to how you got involved in business itself, right? Walk us through how that all came about, if you can. Okay. I was, um, I had just graduated from university. I was living in Toronto. I was doing a a grad program in PR, which I love doing. Obviously, that's not obviously, but that's what I do a lot right now. So World Fishing Network headquarters was starting up in Toronto and my dad was mentoring for them because they were businessmen. They were not anglers at all. And so it was basically my dad, as it happens most of the time, he's basically like my unofficial agent and manager. He pitched me. He said that there, I have a daughter and she's very comfortable in front of the camera and she grew up fishing and being in the outdoors world. So literally how I started with them was the Toronto Sportsman Show was happening. They got me to go on stage and lead Q&As with the pro anglers at that time. That was my first taste of it. And that was at that point where I realized, why haven't I just been trying to follow in my uncle and my dad's footsteps? This is awesome. You like talking about fishing and outdoors and getting paid for it. So once I had that aha, uh-huh, moment, then I officially pitched myself to the World Fishing Network. And this is a real blast of the past. So I started out after that doing a five minute online show for them. And again, this was about 10 years ago. So this was before everything is done now. So having like an online show was new, but it was obviously the way to go. So it was called, I actually don't even remember what it was called. You can Google it. They're hilarious. (laughs) Something like fishing facts with Mariko or something, but 
I did five minutes of fishing facts in a really fun and light way. And that's how I got my toes wet with World Fishing Network. And then basically, I just kept embedding myself more and more. And I even applied for a web job, which I'm, that's not my forte, but just so that I could get in there full time, knowing that if I was in there full time, I could pitch even more. Got that job. And then I eventually came to the travel fishing TV show, which is what they liked as well. And then we started shooting that in July 2008. We shot the pilot. Funny when you mentioned about the fishing facts. I actually think I remember that, those five minute fishing yeah, facts. Yeah, it was. Then we did a lot. Like I would. I would leave my, actually by then I had a real job in PR. I would leave that job early every Wednesday to go shoot this. We were doing it every week for like at least a year. So there's a lot to be found on YouTube. That's funny. I want to ask you like, so you told us how you kind of got started, but you're young. You have this fishing show. You're hooked up here with World Fishing Network. Like, was that, what was that like? That must have been surreal for you. Like, that's a dream job for most people. or most Definitely a dream job. And it was one of those situations where I was totally conscious of the facts. Like, I wasn't taking it for granted. I knew that this is, this is a TV show. I'm getting paid literally to travel and do awesome adventures. It's not going to last forever. Mm -hmm. Even though I was young, I was conscious of that from the beginning. So I think it's good because I was really able to truly appreciate it. We did six seasons over seven years. I appreciated that whole seven year run. I knew it was something that was unique and unlikely, but I don't think it was really surreal because the thing is, is that is how I grew up. I grew up traveling, having a really chaotic schedule and not really conforming to like a regular quote life. Mm -hmm. So it didn't seem surreal. I just, but I, I was very grateful and conscious of the fact that I was really lucky to have a job. Obviously too, like there's, you know, a a big element was it's my last name and that's why I got the connections that I did in the first place. It took my hard work, my ideas and all of that stuff to continue it. But, you know, to get in the door, I was obviously also grateful that I grew up in the family that I did. Did you have like a hand in saying, hey, I want to go fish in British Columbia for sturgeon, or I want to go down to the flats and do some fly fishing. Like, did you have a hand or a say in where you were going to go travel at all? Yes. So like, I really was heavily involved with every part of the show. So my name was on there as a, I think it was an associate producer or something for a reason. I was, when I wasn't shooting, I was in the office with, um, so this was like in the heyday of the World Fishing Network and they had like a full on 60 person staff. Yeah. So there was a production crew, but I was in the office with them. I was taking the lead on planning of it. It varied from season to season, kind of less interesting business reasons. So some of the seasons we were able to control more where we were going versus others. Mm -hmm. Money, obviously. Mm -hmm. There was that. But yeah, I was definitely taking the lead on tone of each episode even and working closely with another producer, writing all the VOs and recording the VOs. And then after we would come back from a shoot, working with the editor to make sure that you know everything was approved. I mean, to be on the business side of things, that was a difficult part of the job is like any job when you're trying to balance bringing income mm-hmm. in with quality. No, I hear you. Right? So if it's sponsored by a certain person or whatever, it doesn't always jive with like the best time for salmon fishing in BC. Yeah. You might have to go during like the worst time for salmon fishing in BC, but still make an episode out of it because that worked with all the parties involved. That's challenging when you're putting your money with on fish, right? I would never bet on catching a fish. Oh, exactly. You know? Exactly. Most of the time we were lucky, but there was like one time we went fly fishing in the Miramichi in New Brunswick yes. and it was just that, like we literally went during the worst month that you, if you were just a, a regular fly fisher, you never would have booked your trip th- during those two yeah. weeks, but we had to because of scheduling and sponsorship and money. And so we did, and lo and behold, there was got nothing. And so we had to go back and spend more money. Those were challenges for sure. And some seasons were more challenging than others, but that's part of the business. But it just means that if you saw some episodes where the fishing wasn't the greatest, it's <laughs> it's mostly because of the business behind it. I hear it. You know, you mentioned the challenges and it kind of leads me to my next question here. So what are some other early challenges that you faced with WFN? With WF- working with WFN was great. I mostly loved it there. The cha- other challenges that came across, I would say, were just by virtue of it's so normal now. But again, 10 years ago, everybody was just really getting into social media. So it was just dealing with like the hate that you would get, which I've come to realize, like, if you're in the public eye, you're going to get haters and you're going to get lovers, right? And so now it like does, actually, I don't really get any hate anymore, probably because I don't have my show, but it does nothing to me. 
I mean, I shouldn't say nothing, but I can really brush mm-hmm. it off. Whereas at the beginning, it was really jarring, right? It's like this person has no clue about me and they're just spewing hate for no good reason. So that was challenging at the beginning, but that was good to learn for sure. Beyond that, other main challenge, I suppose, was you're away from home mm-hmm. a lot. So that's more on the relationship side. That can be tough because you're doing long distance a lot. And you're also with my job in particular, like I'm meeting a ton of people. So I'm constantly being stimulated. And for a relationship at home, it's important to like focus on them, yeah. and that effort. So sometimes uh, that was challenging. So did you have a relationship on the show? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was with yeah. Paul, um, not with him anymore. But yeah, I was, he was Actually, because we shot for so many years, he was my boyfriend, then fiance, then husband throughout that whole entire thing. So he was really good about it, but for sure, not totally ideal for a relationship. Wow. I didn't know that. Wow. I thought I did all my homework on you. (laughs) Well, I I mean, I'm pretty open. I'm a pretty open person, but yeah, I guess it's harder to... Get yeah, exactly. No, that's <laughs> funny. You know, so what was it like to have the cameras rolling with you like all the time and like traveling around with this camera crew and just like, and it's not just for the show, like you've had that your entire life and it still continues in, in some degree. What's that like? Yeah, well, with social media, especially it's, we're more in the public too. Yeah, it's just like, a, it was mostly normal. Like that was my normal because literally the year I was born was the year that they, that Bob and dad started shooting Mm -hmm. the show. And obviously it was a different time. So it was more compartmentalized, meaning either the camera's on and you're shooting fishing or the camera's not, you're not. Whereas now kind of the camera's all over the place. I didn't think about it much when I was shooting hooking up. It's just really my norm. So it wasn't, it wasn't like, holy crap, look what's happening. I'm just used to having a camera in my face. I have five-year-old home videos. To yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's funny. So your show was in production for six seasons. Looking back, is there anything that you would change now? You would do differently so much? I mean, I think for sure, because it's just a mm-hmm. different time. Like now is a different time. So strategically, you just, you would have to do things differently. But overall, I think it was pretty well managed and we did a good job for what we had kind of what resources we had. Um, I wouldn't change much for that era. There was like a hook it up 2.0. We would have to just change the strategy by virtue of like everything works differently now. And I would probably have a baby on board because I can't leave her <laughs> for like the two weeks that I used to travel at a time. It's kind of funny that you said a 2.0, like a new show hooking up 2.0. Do you still have any affiliation with WFN and any plans to do some kind of show in a new concept even? I don't have an affiliation with WFN. Um, they aren't like a fully functioning company like they used to be when I was Mm -hmm. working for them. They um, were bought out by the Outdoor Group Mm -hmm. in Colorado. There's not a whole set of infrastructure there anymore. So that's the only reason why I'm not affiliated. It just doesn't exist that much. I know that they send out newsletters and they have a website and that sort of thing. That's great. But there's nobody to employ me. That yeah, it does not why I asked. I, I definitely still, I mean, from time to time, I'll touch base with people at the outdoor group and people I know there are great. But again, it's just such a changing landscape now, like the way mm-hmm. that media works. It's the onus is even more on your own individual self to come up with something and create something and even find distribution in a different way. So I would still, I would love to do some sort of video content. The challenge is funding, getting enough money to, I have a few kick-ass um, filmmakers that I've worked with for a couple of things that I would love to use, but of course that takes money. So that's, I haven't figured that out. Well, I mean, it runs yet. in your blood, right? So it's just, that's why I ask and it's hard to, you know, yeah, you're just enough. always there and it's yeah. just hard to be like, okay, stop, like come to a dead stop stop, right? So, totally. you know, I want to shift to what your, you know, your Instagram account and I follow you on Instagram as, as many other people do. And it shows that you're always like, you're always traveling or you're always active um, at sportsman shows or, or doing presentations or seminars and stuff like that. So what, what is it that you're promoting? What are you currently doing with these shows? Just the months from December to about March, especially I'm heavily busy distributing the fly fishing film tour, which is a film festival that was started, of, I don't know, maybe 12 years ago I'm in Colorado by the same producers that produced the Warren Miller ski videos. And so they have a whole team in the US. Um, my partner and I, we own the uh, Canadian distribution rights. So that keeps us really busy for those four months. And that's one of the reasons you see me traveling around a lot. The trade shows is to promote the fly fishing film tour and to host different shows. And we actually had one, you're based yes, in Kelowna, yeah. right? Yeah. So we had one in Kelowna at the beginning of this month and we're going to have one at the end of April in Chilliwack, British Columbia. Um, so we go across Canada and we show these films and it's a proper mini film festival, but of fly fishing films. 
So every year, filmmakers submit their films, literally filmmakers and anglers from around the world. They submit their films to the U.S. head office. They choose about the top 10, and then we put them into about two hours and 50 minutes or so, and we show them to you in one evening in some sort of theater style or cool party style or whatever, where you can really take in the... It's truly beautiful cinematography. Usually there's some cool soundtracks, good storytelling, good characters. It's not anything that you can't see it on TV. You can't see it on YouTube. You have to go to one of our tours to see the full films. So that keeps me really busy. And that's part of why I'm traveling a lot is to promote that within Canada. And then also my partner also runs a guiding business for sturgeon fishing in the Fraser River in British Columbia. And that's another reason why we travel a lot. How did you become involved? Like how did, did they approach you and saying, Hey, do you want to own the Canadian rights to this? Or like, how did that walk us through how that all happened? Like that doesn't just happen to everybody every day. No, actually. So it's because my partner's into fishing also. It's like I'm surrounded by (laughs) fishing people. The story is he's a former hockey player. And so he was still playing professional hockey, but recognized that Hockey doesn't mm-hmm. last forever. So he was, he'd become a sturgeon fishing guide in the summer. And then, you know, this will go back into a lot of details, but I think what he, what happened was he met a guy named R.A. Biati, who's one of the regular filmmakers of the Fly Fishing Film Tour, who's out of Oregon. I think he met him at some point and they became friends. And then that opportunity presented itself. And Kevin was the first one, my partner, to, to get into an agreement with the U.S. side to get the Canadian rights. So when I first met Kev uh, almost five years ago, he was already running the fly fishing tour in Canada. And then because I joined, we were able to make it much larger because he was well connected in the West Coast, but didn't have anybody in the East Coast. And of course, with Mm -hmm. my whole family connections and the World Fishing Network and all of that, I brought together my East Coast connections. And so we've grown it by quite a bit in terms of locations and span of where it tours and attendees. And also because of my background, I've gotten a lot of non-fly fishers come to the show because if you've seen it, you'll know it's just really awesome filmmaking. So you don't have to be like a hardcore fly fisher to really enjoy the films. So I've got fast fishermen and all sorts of housekeepers, of knocking on the door. <laughs> all sorts of uh, types of anglers coming to the shows and they really love it. Where I want to go with this is you, you mentioned that you grew the fly fishing tour here in Canada. What are some other goals, right? What are some oh. other goals that you have going Going forward for the show, or what would you ultimately like to see in a, a five or a 10 year progress? Is that housekeeping? Um, sorry, that's housekeeping, and I have my privacy sign on. Okay, so yes, good question. So the goals would be. For- oh, Marika, I'm just going to stop you there. For the listeners that are wondering, Marika is traveling right now yes. as well. So, as, uh, oh. as expected, so she's in a hotel room right now yeah. doing the podcast. I'm in a hotel room, guys. I'm in my bathrobe on a bed right now. And that was I was tipping knocking on the door. <laughs> Sorry about that. Travel, hashtag travel. <laughs> okay, so, um, oh, what is that? Ladies and gentlemen, do you, we have your attention. Yep. Do you hear that? And now during a podcast, we're having a fire alarm test. That's hilarious. I swear we can't even stage this if we tried. This is hilarious. Guys, this is real life. Okay, you hear it's a fire alarm test. Like when does that happen? Like once a year or something. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. That's happened like, you know, a few times in my life ever. Okay, we'll keep talking, but we may have to stop it. No, keep talking. Tell me about the goals. So yeah, in order, you were asking about growing and fly fishing. Yeah. So within Canada, since that's where we have the rights, um, what I'd like to do is to kind of no. <laughs> <laughs> Mariko, what are some of the goals that you have for the fly fishing tour um, going forward? Like a five or 10 year plan for growth? My overall plan is to continue to get um, non fly fishers to the show because I think that it's good for fly fishing and I think it's just good for humans to see a different side of what they already like. So for example, if they're any kind of angler outdoors person, um, but they've never tried fly fishing, them just watching these two hours and 50 minutes of variety of fly fishing characters and scenes, I think is really inspiring. My goal is to also, I think, do more events where it's Mm -hmm. targeted towards like younger people 
So maybe let's say like high school crowds or something, same thing because it's just so inspiring and it's kind of might give an extra push to those younger people to get outside and see what's out there, stuff you cannot see from your phone. And then I'd like to continue growing the uh, locations, which we're doing steadily. So just getting the fly fishing film tour in different towns in Canada that it hasn't been in yet, you know, that takes work, but I think that that would be- When we talk about getting into a different town or something, like say if I wanted to get a fly fishing tour in, I'm just going to throw a city out there, Sault Ste. Marie, right? Do I approach you as a, yeah. a local in Sault Ste. Marie and say, hey, I want to get it in there? Like, walk us through that. How yeah. do we do that? Case anyone's wondering. So some of them, yeah, some of the towns we've gotten in because we've actively put effort into trying to find somebody. And then other towns we've gotten in because people have approached us. You literally just email us. You go to our website, flyfishingfilmtour.ca. And we have information there. It's as, as simple as emailing us to info at flyfishingfilmtour.ca. And uh, anybody can host one of our shows. We kind of provide a turnkey in the sense that we give you the films and we give you sponsor swag to give away and we kind of act as a guide. And then it's up to you to decide where you would want to host it, who you'd want to work with. I mean, you have to pay for the venue and that sort of thing, but any income that you generate, whether it's through ticket sales or raffles or any kind of charity thing, then that goes straight to you. So there's a lot of flexibility. I mean, that is how we've recently gotten new uh, cities like Windsor, Ontario. Ontario, we just got last year and we're going to do again this year. That was because a fly fishing mm-hmm. group approached us. And actually we have somebody who's going to host one in Dawson's Creek. That's cool. Um, yes, definitely. If anybody listening is interested, hit us up. Mariko, I want to ask you, do you have any interest in making a film yourself? Definitely. I'm not a har- I'm not like an awesome fly fisher. I will love it. But as you'll see throughout these films, it's not always about being the best fly fisher. There are already have been moments in the past couple of years where I would just wish, wish that we had a camera on because for example, there was two years where we had a friend who had a helicopter and was flying. He was picking us up at our house and then he was flying us over super high, snowy, icy mountains in BC that were like, you know, all nice. throughout our backyard essentially. And then like landing somewhere, we would sight fish, like we would see the fish in the river from the helicopter. And then if it was safe to land, he would land and then we would fish. So that's already happened a few times and I wish we had a camera on that, but there's no official plans in the works right now, but I'm definitely always open to it. And we work closely with some of the filmmakers that often submit their films. So it's always a possibility. You know what, Mariko, it's funny that you're so busy and here we are where, you know, you're traveling, you're doing all this, like how do you juggle everything and how do you juggle your home life, motherhood, work life, the successful businesses that you have? Because I know you're also a blogger as well, which I want to ask about, but how do you juggle all that? Yeah, I think it's just like, everybody you just prioritize and some days are better than others I think if you're just like a generally happy person or happy with what you're doing you just make it work it helps that my two-year-old is a go-getter and very cool with traveling and living an unconventional life she's like all for it because that's all she's known but her personality too, she's just really outgoing and we can take her to the trade shows and she's totally fine so that I'm sure that helps that I have a healthy almost type A toddler (laughs) who just goes along with our schedule. You know, there's upsides and downsides to being an entrepreneur too, right? Like the upsides are if she is sick or she doesn't sleep, well, then I just move my work to the next Mm -hmm. six hours and do it whenever I can. Um, Whereas if, you know, you work in an office, it's obviously harder. You have to touch base with your boss and you have to make more plans. I can be a lot more flexible with when I work. So that's the easier part. And then the harder part is just the instability. You don't always know where your paychecks are coming from. Yeah. It's just like anybody, you just, you do juggle it. That's exactly what you do. And you move things around and um, prioritize. It sounds like uh, your daughter is growing up like how you grew up there. It looks like it's very much starting. Yeah. So I, I did mention about your blogs. Can you tell us a bit about your blogs? Because I'm, I, I want to know more. I'm sure we all want to know a bit more of what you're doing in your travel blogs and what they're about. Yeah. So on the side, because I am always traveling, hence this uh, hilarious obstacle of <laughs> fire alarm testing in the hotel room. I write blogs about where I go and some, some of my favorite places um, about where I go to. And that's on travelwithmariko.com. And I've been doing that since, actually, you know what? I started those blogs just after I stopped shooting Hooking Up. So I just recognized that it was 
just something good to keep me busy. I and mean, I knew that even though I was no longer shooting Hooking Up, I'd still be traveling a lot. So it's just a little side hustle and it's fun to do. And if anybody's looking for some information on a specific place, you can always check out my blog list and see if it helps you out. I do a variety of travel between Canada and the US, but then also far reaching exotic places. You actually just reminded me, for example, I did a blog on mm-hmm. fast fishing in Japan with my dad. And the trip was a total family trip a long time ago, but my dad and I just snuck in some bass fishing for a morning. And I just got an email, for example, about more details about the bass fishing guide. So it's just good little tidbits that people can pick up. I'm going to go here. So your husband, is he? he's also a fisher, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Yeah. So he owns Sturgeon Slayers, which is a fishing guiding business out of the Fraser River. He mostly fishes out of Hope in British Columbia. He's like hardcore about his conservation of the, of the species and his tagline is catch record. Do you go out with him often? Yes. Yeah. I love sturgeon fishing. It is so unique because they're prehistoric creatures. In fact, before I'm for the like the longest time when I was still yeah. in Ontario, I didn't even yeah. I had not even heard about sturgeon. Coming from Ontario, you don't hear about them. They're not there, right? But uh, yeah, the in hope in that area, it's really beautiful on the river. Sometimes if they're really big sturgeon, you get in the water with them to measure them, get their data. And that's a really, really cool, unique experience. I suppose it's similar yeah. to fly fishing in the sense that you get in the water, which is part of the fun. But uh, yeah, I go out whenever I can. Sometimes I go out with his clients. Sometimes they request me specifically just for because they've seen hooking up or they know what Izumi. So I take those opportunities to go out and then we take out Yale my two-year-old quite a bit because it's obviously a really healthy activity for her to do. So she's probably been out a good 10 times at least, I would say. How does your husband feel about marrying into a Canadian fishing icon family? <laughs> I think he likes it because it obviously yeah, has I some bet, good synergy with uh, fishing business. Uh, I bet. No, that's if why we're I being asked. honest. Hey, Mariko, <laughs> you know, you fished, I don't know how many, how many countries have you fished in now? Oh, okay. So I don't know how many countries I've fished. I know I've been to 40 countries, but I I don't know how many of those I've fished in. I have Let not done know. that tally. I'm going to do that later today. I would probably say if I had to guess out of those 40 countries, I've probably fished in like 15 or so 20. So out of the 15, 20, where's your yeah. favorite place? I know BC's home for you now. Yeah, I love BC. Yes. Like there's just so much amazing fisheries here from the sturgeon fishing in Fraser River to like the salmon fishing up in northern Haida Gwaii. I just... And then like the fly fishing and all these amazing small rivers. But if I had to choose another place, Costa Rica is one of my other go-tos for fishing. It's pretty awesome. I caught my first rooster fish there last year. It's also good for like getting the snappers or mahi mm-hmm. mahi if you eat fish and then eat them that night. You know, we catch and release most of our fish, but if there's an opportunity to get something where you're going to eat it, and that's fun too. I would say Costa Rica is pretty awesome because there's just so many variety of types of fishing you can do. And then also what really sticks out in my mind is tarpon fishing. Well-rounded for sure. With Costa Rica, it it helps that I think you just built a house for it. Am I correct? Yeah. So it's my parents, but they're older baby boomers. So I've been Mm -hmm. taking the lead on getting it going just because, you know, I can do certain things faster. (laughs) So yeah, it's fine. It's, it's done. And we stayed there for the first time earlier this year. And we have an awesome, awesome local fishing guide who we're friends with, who fishes out of the town that we're at. It'll certainly be like a good opportunity to get out fishing a lot now because when your parents have a house there, the cost of traveling there diminishes quite a bit. You know, Mariko, what keeps you moving forward in the fishing industry? Like you're just always the next thing, the next thing. What, what is, what keeps you that drive going for you? Well, I think anybody who's like making any kind of money in fishing can agree that it's not easy because even though it's, it's a weird thing, even though it's a, it's a pastime of so many millions of people in North America, it's still somehow not mainstream. So to actually make money in that industry, it's really hard. So I don't think I do it because it's easy. Mm -hmm. I think it's just, it's in me, ingrained in me. It's like anything, the more that you expose yourself to people and places in that industry, um, if you're open to it, then the more opportunities come up. To touch on that, it's just, you know, you're, you're passionate, right? And I think that passion and that fire just keeps you going for sure. Definitely. You bet. Now, I do always ask my guests one question, and I'm going to have to ask you that as well. What is one thing you would change within the fishing industry? It's okay. The thing I would change is kind of the issue that's happening like majorly in the US right now, which is I wish I wish that it wasn't so segregated, meaning mm-hmm. like it has to be you're on one team or the other team or so whether it's 
type of fishing or type of brand or whatever. I just wish that people could be a little more collective in the business. Yeah, you're, you're not alone on that. I mean, I've asked this to lots of brands and lots of people on the podcast. Everyone always knows that. And you're not alone on that answer. Quite a few people are, are saying the same thing as well. Okay. So Yeah, I kind of wish people could chill out and just work together more. You know, what would you say your biggest takeaway from your career has been so far? Ooh, that's a tough question. That's a good one. I think it's the takeaway that anybody with life experience who has worked a big part of their life should come away with, which is just that no matter what, you have to say true to your authentic self if you want to be successful. And I don't just mean monetarily. I just mean like happy Mm -hmm. and good with what you're doing. As long as you are doing it within a direction that is true to however you are versus trying to be however somebody or an industry is telling you how to be, then I think you're good. And I obviously that can apply to any life or industry or anything, but because that way, then if you make mistakes or if you have failures, perceived failures, or you're just, you're not like number one in any person's mind, it doesn't really matter you're still happy with everything because you're not being fake. For sure, Mariko. I do want to ask you, if someone wanted to get a hold of you for brands or a brand wanted to work with you or wish to align with you in a collaboration, like how would they go about doing that? There's a variety of ways now. I'd say I'm on Instagram a lot. So you can always just nudge me and send me a message on Instagram, which is just at Mariko Izumi. Twitter and Facebook, you can try me, but I'm really not on there a lot. So your best bet is Instagram. If you really, you know, have something specific, then you can always email me at Mariko at Mariko goizumi.com. Brands are you currently working with right now? Kuda, which is a fishing knives and tools company. And I work with them on a bunch of levels. Their website is kudabrand.com and on it, which is a healthy lifestyle company out of Austin, Texas. They are an awesome company. Mariko, we're at the part where we have our frequently asked questions by our listeners. And I'm going to ask you a few questions here. How many days a year do you fish? Well, that really varies depending on my projects. But I would say on average, between fly fishing, sturgeon fishing, bass fishing with my dad, fishing on his pond, probably 50 to 60 days. Your dad has a pond? I had to guess. Oh, yeah. My dad, my parents live... So we grew up in the suburbs, but now my parents live on 150 acres in the country outside of Toronto. Wow. So my dad hunts and fishes on his own property. So he has, I think he has like three ponds and tons of acreage. So you're going to have to throw that stuff on Instagram. I want to see it. Yeah. I've done my stories before in the summer times a lot when we visit them. You know, I can ask you one last question here. So where can we find you again, Mariko, really quickly? So you can find me on Instagram, Mariko Izumi. Or you can find me at travelwithmariko.com, which is where my blog is. Or you can email me at mariko at marikoizumi.com. And also for those BC listeners, a reminder, we'll have a fly fishing film tour night, April 25th in Chilliwack, BC. 